Good morning students. Welcome to today's lecture. Today we'll be discussing the part 2 of the topic disorders of bone. In the previous lecture we had discussed about fibrooseous lesions. In today's topic we will be discussing about categorization of bone disorders and give at least three examples for each. We will be able to list out the three types of fibrooseous lesions and describe them in detail. Differentiate clinicopathologically between the three types of fibrooseous lesions. Uh, identify and illustrate the histopathology of fibrooseous lesions, central granuloma. So, we are already familiar with this slide. We have discussed the various categories of lesions which are affecting the bone. These lesions are fibrooseous lesions, inherited and developmental disorders of bone, inflammatory diseases of bone, metabolic and endocrine disorders of bone, Pages disease of bone, central giant cell granuloma, exostasis, and other tumors of the bone. So, let us refresh with the description of the term fibrooseous lesions. Fibrooseous lesions are a diverse group of processes characterized by replacement of normal bone by fibrous tissue containing a foci of mineralization that vary in amount and appearance. So as discussed earlier, fibrooseous lesions are such lesions wherein the normal bone becomes defective and it's gradually replaced by a, a fibrous tissue. We have also discussed the classification of fibrooseous lesions given by the World Health Organization, wherein the fibrooseous lesions are broadly categorized into fibrous dysplasia, osseous dysplasia, and ossifying fibroma. We have already discussed these lesions in the previous lecture. Today we will be discussing about central giant cell granuloma, cherism, solitary, uh, solitary bone cyst, and aneurysmal bone cyst. We will be discussing about other other topics as well. So let us begin with the first lesion, central giant cell granuloma. The term central giant cell granuloma is reserved to the lesion which occurs within the bone. The word central means that it is an intraosseous lesion. Central giant cell granuloma occurs over a wide age group. It is most common in the second and third decade of life. The lesion may present as a rapid to slow growing swelling of the bone. These lesions are generally symptomless. Lesions are more commonly seen in females. Maxilla being the more common site of predilection. The lesion commonly occurs in the anterior part of the mandible. The pathogenesis of central giant cell granuloma is relatively unknown. However, it has been suggested that it could be a reaction to some form of hemodynamic disturbance in the bone marrow, possibly related to uh, an etiology related to trauma or hemorrhage. Radiographic features of central giant cell granuloma includes a unilocular or multilocular radiolucency. Most of the lesions of central giant cell granuloma crosses the midline in the anterior region. The lesion presents as a well-defined radiolucent area with thinning expansion of the, of the cortex and sometimes it may lead to perforation as well. The involved tooth are generally displaced and the roots may show some resorption. Here you can see a, a multilocular lesion in the anterior mandible. You can see the thin septae which is causing the multilocular appearance. A biopsy of a lesion from central giant cell granuloma will reveal a large number of multinucleated osteoclast-like giant cells in a vascular stroma that is rich in small spindle-shaped cells. 
you will also be able to see foci of extravasated RBCs and deposits of hemocytrin within the stroma. Occasionally, the tissue may also reveal few trabeculae of osteoid or bone formation. So, in this magnified image, you can see that the stroma is fibrovascular. There are number of spindle shaped cells along with forming blood vessels and collagen fibers. You can also see numerous large multinucleated giant cells scattered throughout the stroma. To be able to identify a multinucleated giant cell, you should be able to appreciate that it is a single cell. The cell will be large in size, larger than the usual cells seen within the connective tissue. As you can see in this photomicrograph, the cell is quite large in dimension. You can follow the cell membrane and within the cytoplasm you can see multiple nucleus which are haphazardly present. These multinucleated giant cells generally show a haphazard arrangement of nucleus. You can see extravasated RBCs throughout the stroma. As well you can see a hemocidrin pigmentation within the stroma. These extravasated RBCs and hemocidrin pigments possibly suggest a traumatic etiology which would have resulted in hemorrhage and hence appreciated within the tissue. Treatment for central giant cell granuloma basically requires complete excision or surgical cure attach. So, to revise the topic once again, it should be remembered that most of these lesions occur in the anterior premolar anterior region between the premolars or ahead of the premolars these lesions are always intraosseous hence the term central giant cell granuloma has been used this lesion should not be confused with another lesion also referred to as peripheral giant cell granuloma the peripheral giant cell granuloma is not a variant of central giant cell granuloma other than the similarity within the terminology, these are two separate lesions and hence should not be confused. Central giant cell granuloma shows numerous foci of osteoclast like giant cells in a richly vascular stroma along with extravasated red blood cells and hemocytrin pigments. An important diag uh, differential diagnosis to consider during the evaluation of central giant cell granuloma is hyperparathyroidism which shows similar features to this lesion. We will discuss about hyperparathyroidism in the further slides. And for treatment central giant cell granulomas require curettage and sometimes may also include uh, use of steroids, intralesional steroids. So moving on to the next lesion involving the bone that is Chervism. Chervism is a rare disorder of bone inherited as an autosomal dominant character. This lesion is related to genetic mutation involving the SH3BP2 gene. This gene encodes a cell signaling molecule which are associated in the regulation of inflammation and bone remodeling. Hence, a genetic mutation of the SH3BP2 gene will result in some disorganized bone formation as a result. The term cherism relates to unusual clinical appearance and facial deformity of the patients with this disease. This term has been derived from the term chirrups, which are biblical angelic characters described. These angelis, angelic characters are said to have a chubby face. Patients with cherusm show similar facial appearance and hence the name cherusm has been used to describe this pathology. So 
discussing the clinical features for this pathology. The characteristic feature being facial deformity that involves fullness of the cheeks and the jaws producing a typical chubby face. Cherubism is more common, in fact twice as common in males as compared to females. Children who suffer from terrorism appear normal at birth. But painless swellings of the jaw begin to appear starting from the age of 2 to 4. The swelling then gradually enters a, a static phase around the age of 7 wherein there is no further increase in growth of the lesion. This lesion further regresses on its own as the patient nears the age of puberty. Cherusum generally presents as a bilateral lesion. So as the swelling are usually symmetrical, they may involve the mandible alone or sometimes the maxilla may also be affected. It has to be remembered that the swellings grow in the early childhood, then enter a static phase and then regress on its own. Additionally, you can see that the patients generally display a rim of sclera, which may be visible beneath the iris. This could be due to stretching of the skin over the maxilla or because of the upward displacement of the orbit by lesions involving the maxilla. This appearance has been classically described as the eyes upturned to heaven appearance. Additionally, we can also appreciate that there is a fullness of the submandibular space. This is due to hyperplasia of the submandibular lymph nodes. So, these clinical features that is the eyes upturned to heaven appearance, chubby cheek and fullness of the submandibular space together contribute to the cherubic appearance which we had earlier discussed. Additionally, there will be abnormalities of the dentition that include premature loss of deciduous teeth, displacement of teeth, lack of eruption of permanent teeth, or failure of development of permanent teeth. Radiographically, cherubism presents as a multilocular radiolucency. The cortical plates are usually thin out. Since this lesion occurs predominantly in the childhood, we can also appreciate multiple unerupted and deciduous, uh, unerupted teeth and displaced teeth as you can see in this radiograph. First, you can appreciate the multilocular radiolucency in the mandible ramus area. You can see that this multilocular radiolucency are seen on both the sides. These radiolucencies generally involve the, the posterior angle and the ramus. It should be noted that the condyles are generally spared. Additionally, as you can see that there are multiple unerupted tooth which are present at different levels. This gives a floating teeth appearance to this situation. An eosinophilic cuff around the blood vessels. A thin rim of eosinophilic cuff can be seen around the blood vessels. These are because of collagen deposition. In the late stages of the lesion, we can see some immature bone formation within the fibrous connective tissue. As you can see in this magnified image, we can appreciate numerous multinucleated giant cells. We can also appreciate the characteristic perivascular eosinophilic cuffing which is most commonly seen in cherubism. It should be remembered that 
Terrorism is a self-limiting condition. As I had already described, the lesion generally begins in the earlier childhood, following which it attains a static phase for a prolonged duration and it begins to re regress around the age of puberty. Hence, treatment is generally not required. However, if there is a, a, a concern of asymmetry, cosmetic surgery is may be considered. Okay, to summarize, cherubism is an inherited disorder. We will see a positive family history of a similar lesion in a family member as well. The gene associated with cherubism is described as SH3BP2 gene. Clinical features of this lesion are distinct. This lesion shows a bilateral, symmetrical, multilocular radiolucency of the posterior mandible. Histological evaluation reveals numerous multinucleated giant cells. Also numerous enlarged lymph nodes will be appreciated. The next topic for this discussion is Paget's disease of bone. This disease was first reported by Sir James Paget in 1877. During that time, he termed this lesion as osteitis deformance. Paget's disease of bone is characterized by abnormal and anarchic resorption and deposition of bone, resulting in distortion and weakening of the affected bones. The pathogenesis of Paget's disease is relatively unknown. Various possible etiologies have been proposed. These include a genetic etiology possibly related to an autosomal dominant trait. Some have considered it to be a, a viral disease related to the measles infection. Some have also cons considered it to be a reactive lesion secondary to an inflammation. Paget's disease of bone is characterized by disorganized formation and remodeling of bone, unrelated to functional requirements. As discussed, the etiology is unclear. But what is known is there is a primary dysfunction of the osteoclasts. The natural history of the disease can be divided into three progressive and overlapping phases. Pages disease occurs predominantly in patients who are above 40 years of age. There are typical geographical differences in incidence. Pages disease is commonly seen in the British population, people living in North America, and people from the Australasian region, that is Australia, New Zealand and surrounding countries. The three phases which can be seen in Paget's disease of bone have been described as the early phase, the intermediate phase or the final phase. Early phase is also known as the lytic phase or hot phase. This disease is rarely diagnosed at this phase because this is the beginning of the pathology. The osteoclasts become active and sharply defined radiolucent areas may be seen. Pages disease may sometimes be detected in the early phase incidentally. Intermediate phase also known as the mixed phase shows osteolytic areas which are more in number and disorganized osteoblastic activity lays down coarse trabecular of one bone. Radiographically, this stage presents a mixed radiolucent radiodense areas. There is thickening of the bony cortex. In the final phase or late stage of the disease, also known as the cold phase, the previously formed bone 
remodels to form lamellar bone. This phase shows the characteristic mosaic pattern in the histological section. The bone appears radiodense as in sclerotic bone. So, clinically, patients suffering from Pages disease of bone shows varying degrees of bone deformity. The bone deformity and distortion generally involves the weight bearing a, a portion of the skeleton. That is the long bones and that of the skull and the facial bones. When it involves the skull, patients may also show signs and symptoms of sensory and motor disturbances. This is because of the compression of the nerves which pass through the various foramen in the skull. When the Paget's disease of bone affects the facial skeleton, it results in progressive enlargement of the bones of the maxilla and mandible. As you can see in this image, there is progressive enlargement of the maxillary bone. This gives rise to a characteristic facial appearance which has also been described as leontoiasis eosia. This means the lion's face. So going ahead with the oral manifestations. Within the oral cavity you can see that there is a progressive enlargement of maxilla. The alveolar ridge becomes thickened and widened which leads to flattening of the palate and overall there is an increase in facial deformity. The bony enlargement may lead to incompetence of the lips. The patient may be unable to approximate the lips at rest. This feature should be particularly kept in mind. As Page's disease of bone generally occurs in the older age group, we would find a number of edentulous patients who may be affected with this disease. So one of the typical clinical complaint, chief complaint given by such patients would be a difficulty in wearing dentures. This is because of the progressive increase in the jaw size. However, in dentate patients, this enlargement leads to derangement of occlusion there will be increased spacing between the teeth. The anterior teeth may be retroclined, whereas the posterior teeth may be inclined palatally. Radiographically, we can see a number of features. Pages disease generally shows generalized hypersementosis. The tooth may become ankylosed and lead to difficulties during extraction. Bone resorption may occur during the osteolytic phase, that is the initial phase. In the active stages of the disease, that is during the mixed phase, extraction of a tooth may lead to complications such as hemorrhage. This is because the vascularity of the marrow is high during this phase. In the later phase, the bone becomes so dense and evascular that extraction sockets become prone to infection. As discussed earlier, in the initial phases there is osteolytic changes. This is followed by patchy osteosclerosis in the intermediate stage. In this stage, we will be able to see ill-defined, irregular, patchy radio-opaque areas within the bone. This has been described as the cotton wool appearance. This is the most typical radiographic feature associated with Paget's disease of bone. Additionally, we can also identify features that is loss of lamina dura. We have discussed hypersementosis and ankylosis already. 
Page's disease of bone also involves investigation of serum to support the diagnosis. The serum calcium and serum phosphate levels are usually within normal level. However, there is a marked increase in the level of serum alkaline phosphatase level. The serum alkaline phosphatase level used to be measured in what we knew as Bodensky units. So, for the diagnosis of Page's disease, if the serum alkaline phosphatase level rose to 250 Bodensky unit, it confirmed the diagnosis. However, nowadays we follow a international unit for measuring the alkaline phosphatase level and Bodensky unit is no longer followed. The histopathological involvation also depicts the stage of the disease. In the early stages, there will be numerous osteoclasts seen because this is the lytic phase. So there will be areas of resorption of bony trabeculae and multinucleated giant cells. In the mixed phase, we will be able to see areas of bone resorption. We will also be able to see areas of bone formation. New bony trabeculae will also be forming. As this progresses, the osteoblastic activity predominates the osteolytic activity. Hence, the net increase is seen in the amount of bone formation. This gives rise to what we call as the mosaic bone formation. When the apposition of bone happens, it occurs in increments, such as the Layers in between the imprim, incre, uh, increments are seen as reversal lines. This is also because of the resorption base, which resorption areas which cause the separation of each fragment of the trabeculae. The bone in Page's disease shows numerous such reversal lines which are placed in different orientations. This gives rise to the mosaic pattern or also known as jigsaw puzzle pattern. So it appears that numerous fragments of bone are interattached to each other. This is a characteristic feature of Page's disease of bone. This disease can be controlled medically, generally involves the use of bisphosphonate drugs. However, it should also be remembered that the treatment should be judiciously considered because bisphosphonate drugs are also known to cause another pathology known as medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw, which may complicate invasive dental procedures in patients, especially with Page's disease. To summarize this pathology, Page's disease of bone generally occurs in the older age group. Initially, it may be symptomless and identified incidentally. Results in spacing of the tooth. There may be bone pain with associated with varying degrees of bone deformity. Various complications are caused, especially related to hypersementosis, ankylosis and bone sclerosis. This pathology is associated with three phases that is osteolytic phase, mixed phase and osteosclerotic phase. There is disorganized remodeling of bone which results in a mosaic or jigsaw puzzle pattern in bone biopsies. Moving further, we will discuss some metabolic and endocrine disorders of bone. One of the most common endocrinal disorder of bone is osteoporosis. I am sure we would have heard about this pathology. Yes, osteoporosis is a pathology wherein the, the bone loses, gradually loses its mineral content such that it becomes less mineralized and weaker. 
Osteoporosis is common in postmenopausal women. It commonly affects the women generally two times as compared to the males. Osteoporosis leads to a number of complications associated with bone, especially the long bones. However, in case of the oral cavity, it may lead to loss in the jaw, bone loss in the jaw and around the tooth, such that it results in loosening and loss of tooth. The gradual resorption of the bone also affects the alveolar ridge, which may cause loosening of or ill-fitting dentures. There may be an increased prevalence of periodontal diseases in patients suffering from osteoporosis. OPGs from patients suffering from osteoporosis generally reveal a decreased bone height that is because of the accelerated resorption of the bone. Also we could appreciate the decreased mineral density of the bone. This can be appreciated on the basis of the level of radio opaque opacity seen within the radiographs. Another disease which I mentioned before that we need to know about is hyperparathyroidism. This pathology is common in middle aged women. This is caused by an increased secretion of the parathyroid hormone. It should be remembered that the parathyroid hormone is associated with the calcium metabolism. The parathyroid hormone results in the uptake of calcium from the intestinal channels, from the intestine and from the bone. Hyperparathyroidism can be caused by many causes. It can be related to hyperplasia, adenoma or carcinoma of the, uh, of the parathyroid gland itself may be a result of chronic hypocalcemia, chronic renal failure, rickets and osteomalacia as well. Clinically, patients suffering from hyperparathyroidism will show hypercalcemia, hypercalciuria, increased absorption of calcium, pathological calcification and renal calculi formation. In the jaw, a typical lesion is formed in cases of hyperparathyroidism. This lesion generally shows multifocal, multilocular radiolucencies. As you can see in this image, this is a case associated with hyperparathyroidism and this shows a multilocular radiolucent area involving the 3, 3 to 4, 7 region. It should be remembered that this lesion appears similar to the lesion which we discussed earlier that is the central giant cell granuloma. As we had discussed then central giant cell granuloma is also a multilocular radiolucent lesion which is common in the mandible and in the anterior part of the mandible. So this lesion should be considered in the differential diagnosis and should be ruled out. Biopsy of the lesion generally shows a brownish appearance. This is probably because of the increase in hemosiderin pigmentation within the lesion. This gross appearance has led to the description of this lesion as Brown's tumor. Histopathologically, the lesion shows increased osteoclastic activity which is suggested by an increase in number of multinucleated giant cells. The connective tissue is vascular and fibroblastic in nature. There is increased hemosiderin pigmentation. As you can observe, these features are also seen in the central giant cell granuloma. So how do we differentiate? We have to keep in mind that central giant cell granuloma is not related to the hyperparathyroidism. Hence, the serum analysis will rule out the presence of increased 
parathyroid hormone level. Rickets and osteomalacia are metabolic disorders of the bone related to the deficiency of vitamin B. Vitamin sorry, vitamin D. Vitamin D is related to the normal maturation of bone. So if there is a deficiency of vitamin D in early childhood, it results in rickets. Vitamin D deficiency during the adult life results in what we call as osteomalacia. So in both these conditions, there is decreased uptake of calcium from the intestine, which is facilitated by vitamin B. So the decreased calcium level results in multiple bony abnormalities. In relation to the tooth, it results in various dental anomalies such as enamel hypoplasia, increased width of the predentine, increased amount of interglobular bone. So with this I conclude today's discussion. Any doubts or comments related to the topics discussed today or the previous topics can be posted on the Google Classroom link provided. The video will also be uploaded in the link. So you can go through the lecture video and post your doubts. So we are now in the recovery phase of the MCO. Hopefully things will get better soon and we would be going back to college soon. Until then I request all of you to stay safe. Happy studying from home. Take care. With this, I conclude today's lecture. Thank you for the patient listening.